Exodus chapter 5, we begin with verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? Get you unto your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. And the taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where ye can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say to us, Make brick. And behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall ye deliver the tale of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case, after it was said, Ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way, as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. And now if you would look ahead a couple of chapters to chapter 9, Exodus chapter 9, and we'll read just a couple of verses here, beginning in verse 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee, and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. Amen. We'll end our reading in verse 15.
Exodus chapter 9. We know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. We'll actually be visiting another portion a little later from chapter 32 as well, but I did not include that in the reading just now. Let me call your attention in particular to verse 3 from the chapter we've just read from. Exodus chapter 5 and verse 3, notice what it says. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Last week we began a study that I've entitled The Theology of Pestilence and Plagues. Theology, of course, is the study of God. The word theology comes from two Greek words. There's the word theos, which means God, and there's the word that in Greek is a form of the word logos, which in this case would mean study. So study, the study of God, theology, the study of God. And in our case, we're considering a very particular application of the study of God, which is its connection to pestilence and plagues. I made it the first point of our study last week to simply show that there is a definite connection to pestilence, plagues, and God. He rules over them. In Exodus 9.14, we read the Lord's word to Pharaoh through Moses, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. And we may note from that text not only that God is the source from whom the plagues are sent, but that he owns them as his own. Note again, I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart. You see how God takes charge of them. He owns them. He doesn't regard them as something that he has no oversight over. He directs them. They're his. He sends them. Well, today I want to move on from the first mention of the word plague, which is what we looked at last week, to the chapters in Scripture that are probably the most well-known chapters when it comes to the matter of plagues. You know the story, I'm sure. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt, had been for a long time. This had been foretold by God himself when in the book of Genesis, chapter 15, he caused a deep sleep to come upon Abraham. So we read in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 12, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, in horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Well, in Moses' day, the time of that judgment had arrived, and Moses had been preserved and raised up just for that time. God had heard the cryings of his people and was now at last ready to deliver Israel from their slavery by bringing them out of Egypt with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. Pharaoh, of course, was not on board with that program, He certainly recognized the value of cheap labor, so there was no way he was going to let Israel go. We read his words back in chapter 5, verse 2. This is Pharaoh speaking. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And so you could say that a contest ensues between the Lord and Pharaoh. It's a contest, really, between Pharaoh's hard heart and a series of ten plagues unleashed upon him and the Egyptians. I wonder how many of you, especially you children, can you name those ten plagues? 
You sometimes see them, see them taught in children's Sunday school classes. Perhaps your parents can test you today. See if you can list the ten plagues that God sent to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. I'll run them down for you very quickly, then you can review them later. You have the Nile River turned to blood. You have the plague of the frogs, the plague of lice. Some people say that lice really were gnats or possibly even mosquitoes. You have the plague of flies, the plague of moraine, which affected the cattle in the field. You have the plague of boils and blains, the plague of hail and fire, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, and at last, the plague of the death of the firstborn of every man and beast. Now, before we go any further, it may be appropriate for me just to note the very close connection between pestilence and plagues. The two words are different, but they're basically synonyms which mean pretty much the same thing. In chapter 9 and verse 14, we read the Lord's word, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people. At a later time in the history of Israel, the word of the Lord through Amos would be, I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. So the afflictions unleashed by the Lord upon Egypt can be referred to really as either pestilence or plagues. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia gives a very interesting definition of the word pestilence. It's this, any sudden fatal epidemic is designated by this word. And then its biblical use, it generally indicates that these are divine visitations. Based on such a definition, it certainly seems appropriate, doesn't it, to call our current coronavirus pandemic a pestilence. It's proving in many cases to be fatal. It certainly come upon the world suddenly, and it must be acknowledged that this is most certainly a divine visitation. The thing I want to draw your attention to today is a close connection to pestilence and worship. Pestilence and worship, is there really a connection between those things? Well, I'm going to show you that there is. We generally think of these chapters in Exodus as being about ten plagues unleashed on Pharaoh in Egypt, and indeed most of the focus, most of the chapters uh, in this section of Exodus uh, convey to us that narrative, that, that narrative. What's easy to miss or overlook, however, is that the very first time Moses mentions pestilence to Pharaoh, he doesn't do so with reference to pestilence coming upon Pharaoh, but rather the potential for pestilence to come upon Israel. Did you catch that when we read that back in chapter 5? Look at it again in chapter 5 and verse 3. This is the first mention in the Bible of that term pestilence, as well as the first mention of it to Pharaoh by Moses. And so we read, and they, they referring to Moses and Aaron, and they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. It's a rather interesting statement, isn't it? They're not threatening Pharaoh now at this time with pestilence that could be unleashed upon him. They're saying, we must go three days' journey into the desert to sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. We'll need to look more closely at that statement in just a moment or two. In the ensuing narrative, of course, we have the account of the ten plagues being unleashed on Pharaoh in Egypt. And eventually the Egyptians do let the Israelites go. 
Later in the narrative of the book of Exodus, we have yet another scene that we have to visit. It's the scene that takes place while Moses is in the Mount of God, receiving the Ten Commandments that are written in stone by the very finger of God. Moses is called up into that mount. He spends 40 days there, during which time he receives very specific instructions about how the tabernacle was to be built and how God was to be worshipped. On his return trip back to the Israelites from the Mount of God, Moses discovers that the children of Israel have fallen into sensual idolatry. Aaron has fashioned a golden calf, and the people were engaged in worship. Indeed, their carrying on was in connection with a feast that Aaron had announced the previous day. A feast unto the Lord. And it takes the intercession of Moses to restrain the judgment of God. In that intercession, you have that well-known verse, that text in chapter 32 and verse 31. It says, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin... And that's followed by that long dash, which indicates a pause. If thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And in the last verse of chapter 32, we read in verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people, because they made the calf which Aaron made. So we see then what you could call three scenes in which a connection is made with the plagues of God and the practice of worship. Scene one, Moses before Pharaoh telling him the Israelites must be turned loose to worship God lest pestilence fall on the Israelites. Scene two, God unleashing his plagues upon Pharaoh until at last he lets the people go to hold that feast to the Lord. And scene three, golden calf worship, in which the people at the end of chapter, at the end of the chapter, are plagued by the Lord. From these three scenes, I want you to focus with me for just a couple of moments this morning on the theology of pestilence and plagues and the connection to worship. Okay, the theology of pestilence and plagues and the connection to worship. There are three dangers presented to us in these three scenes. And what I want to do in the moments that remain is consider these dangers that we may be instructed and admonished and encouraged to avoid them. Three dangers then to avoid. Let's think first on the danger of neglected worship. The danger of neglected worship. This takes us to what I'm now calling scene one in Exodus 5. Moses and Aaron in this chapter are coming before Pharaoh for the very first time. Moses had seen the Lord in the burning bush and had been commissioned by God to lead Israel out of Egypt. Following an argument with God in which Moses sought to excuse himself from that assignment, Aaron is assigned to accompany Moses and to be the spokesman, so to speak, for Moses. Their very first words to Pharaoh are the words we read earlier in chapter 5. Look at them with me again. This is Exodus 5 in verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us, let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Lest he fall upon us with pestilence. That's the first mention of pestilence to Pharaoh. 
I pointed out a moment ago, and it bears repeating now because it's very easy to overlook it in the broader context of this section of Exodus. Moses must lead Israel away into the desert to hold a feast unto the Lord and to sacrifice unto the Lord, and they must do this in order to avoid a punishment that is specified by Moses as being the punishment of pestilence. Now Moses and Israel, you see, were the chosen people of God. They were the descendants of Abraham who had been chosen and called by God to leave his homeland in order to go to the land that the Lord would show them. We considered in our last study from Genesis 12 that Abraham was a man of the altar, which means he built altars in various places in the course of his pilgrimage. Christ tells us in John chapter 8 that Abraham rejoiced to see Christ's day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham, in other words, was able to make the connection between animal sacrifices he offered on the altar and their connection to Christ. Now, hundreds of years later, God would have his chosen people worship him, and in that worship there had to be sacrifice. The foundation of the covenant of grace or the covenant of redemption, you see, was sacrifice the eventual sacrifice of Christ himself. Now, on the surface of the words, the statement Moses makes to Pharaoh about the Israelites having to venture out into the desert for three days in order to worship the Lord, in order to avoid the potential punishment of pestilence, that might seem harsh. Is God so desirous of worship that he's willing to threaten Moses and Israel with pestilence if they fail to worship him? Is God so self-absorbed that he has to resort to such extreme measures to receive his due from Moses and from Israel? Now, in order to answer that question, we have to keep in mind the infinite contrast between God and men. One of my favorite books, and I put this uh, uh, very near the top of every book I've ever read, okay? It's a book entitled The Pleasures of God by John Piper. He devotes a chapter in that book to the pleasure that God takes in his son. We may conclude, he writes, that the pleasure of God in his Son is pleasure in himself. Since the Son is the image of God and the radiance of God and the form of God, equal with God and indeed is God, therefore God's delight in the Son is delight in himself. The original, the primal, the deepest, the foundational joy of God is the joy he has in his own perfections as he sees them reflected in the glory of his Son. This whole book is devoted to the topic of the self-sufficiency of God. I think it's the first book, the only book I've ever read that can take that, what in, in, in the minds of some, I suppose, is a deep, theological subject, and he makes it very practical. Piper is aware of how such pleasure in self might appear on the surface of it to be vanity. He goes on to write, at first, this sounds like vanity. It would be vanity if we humans found our deepest joy by looking in the mirror we would be vain and conceited and smug and selfish if we were like God in this regard. But why? Aren't we supposed to imitate God? Yes, in some ways, but not in every way. This was the first deceit of Satan in the Garden of Eden. He tempted Adam and Eve to try to be like God in a way that God never intended them to be like him, namely in self-reliance. Only God should be self-reliant. All the rest of us should be God-reliant. 
In the same way, we were created for something infinitely better and nobler and greater and deeper than self-contemplation. We were created for the contemplation and enjoyment of God. Anything less than this would be idolatry toward him and disappointment for us. God is the most glorious of all beings. Not to love him and delight in him is a great loss to us and insults him. End quote. Do you begin to see now why in the case of Moses and Israel, the neglect of the worship of God is such a serious matter? Man was originally created for that purpose. Man finds in the worship of his creator and redeemer his greatest good. Here is the fulfillment of his purpose for existing. He wasn't created, nor was he redeemed in order to be self-absorbed, but God-absorbed. That's an easy thing to overlook, especially when it comes to salvation, because we benefit so greatly from salvation that it becomes tempting to think that it's all about me. After all, I'm saved. My sins are forgiven. I've been adopted into God's family. I'm the one who's reconciled. I'm justified. Very tempting then to think that it's all about me. And all of these things are true. And there's no denying that believers in Jesus Christ do benefit greatly, but don't ever lose sight of why all these benefits bestowed upon you in salvation. Don't ever lose sight of why they are bestowed. Paul states it. You would do well to read it in the first chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, that the spiritual benefits you and I received in Christ are all to the praise of the glory of his grace. Go back to that chapter this afternoon and underline it. Three times you'll find it. It is all to the praise of the glory of his grace. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And those blessings are enumerated, and we benefit greatly from them. But they are done with the ultimate aim of being to the praise of the glory of his grace. And what this tells us then, and what we learn from the narrative in Exodus 5, is that we must never neglect the worship of Christ. Don't neglect the one who is worthy of all praise. Add your voice to the worshipers in heaven who say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The neglect of the worship of Christ amounts to the neglect of your very purpose for being created by God and redeemed by Christ. You run the risk of failing to reach your highest good as well as the risk of provoking God's displeasure. Moses and Israel had to travel three days into the desert to have that feast to the Lord and to offer sacrifice to the Lord. They were chosen for that purpose, and so were you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. So that's the first danger found in the first scene of our study this morning, the danger of neglecting worship, which uh, held out the potential of pestilence. Well, let's move on to think then on the second scene, which holds out to us the danger of hindering worship. The danger of hindering it. There's the danger of neglecting it, now the danger of hindering it. And this takes us to the most extensive scene in our study today. Scene two, you could say, encompasses Exodus chapters 7 through 12. It's in these chapters that you have the account of the ten plagues being unleashed on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. You remember them? Were you able to list them before I gave them to you in my introduction? 
river turned to blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death. And the issue behind them all was the same. Pharaoh would not let the people go to worship the Lord. Can we not say, based on Pharaoh's stubbornness, that they who hinder the worship of the Lord do so to their own self-destruction? One of the things that I find somewhat amusing in these chapters is the way the Egyptian magicians, up to a point, are able to duplicate the things that Moses does. A common refrain to the waters turned to blood and the frogs is this statement, and the magicians did so with their enchantments. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of a man beating another man, say, with a stick. One man has a stick, the other man does not. So the first man is beating the second man with a stick, and then the second man picks up a stick, and he proceeds to beat himself with that stick and says, look at me, I can do that too. Isn't that sort of what the Egyptian magicians were doing? Self-destruction, because Pharaoh would hinder the worship of Jehovah God. It reached the point, of course, where the magicians couldn't duplicate what Moses was doing, and they went so far as to say to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And by the time you reach the plague of the locusts in chapter 10, you find them pleading with Pharaoh. How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? That's in chapter 10 and verse 7. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and his hardness of heart would eventually lead him to pursue Israel through the divided waters of the Red Sea, which would come crashing down upon him and destroy him and his army. Self-destruction because of a hard heart toward God that would hinder the worship of Jehovah. Oh, if only we could see the truth of that in our culture today. Maybe, just maybe, the Lord would lift the plague and pestilence we suffer from at this time. I've been emphasizing in our studies the need for the people of God to pray. Pray to God for mercy. Pray for the health care workers. Pray for those that are sick who are infected with this virus. But make sure you assign the right priority to your praying. We're taught first to pray, hallowed be thy name. Pray that the Lord's name would indeed be hallowed, so when this plague has run its course, there might be a better attitude toward the worship of Christ, especially on this his day, with regard to the worship of him on his day. If things are unchanged following this coronavirus plague, then our nation will still be on a path to self-destruction with or without the coronavirus. Oh, pray that hardened hearts would be softened during these days and that many would turn to Christ. I've been seeing a number of memes posted on Facebook that express this hope. Wouldn't it be nice if after the coronavirus has run its course that the Lord's Day is designated again as a day of rest and worship toward Christ is not hindered. So we've seen the plagues connected to neglected worship as well as plagues connected to hindered worship. Let's consider finally the danger of perverted worship. This takes us to another scene in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 35, where a plague is listed there in connection with golden calf worship 
It says, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. In our day, it seems there's no shortage of discussions and debates about what's acceptable in worship and what's not. When Aaron was pressed by the people to fashion that golden calf, it wasn't that the Israelites were necessarily bent on worshiping other gods. Oh, no. If you look in chapter 32 and verse 5, you discover that the worship planned for the next day was to be a feast to the Lord. And you'll notice in that verse that the word LORD is in all capital letters. This was to be a feast to Jehovah. And yet it was a worship service that was conformed to the worship of Egypt, or to make the application to our day, it was worship conformed to the world. When Moses, along with his servant Joshua, came down following that 40-day period in the mount, Joshua thought at first that there was the sound of war in the Israelite camp. Moses rightly identified the noise as the noise of singing. It was singing accompanied with dancing. Now those two things taken by themselves wouldn't necessarily be bad. After all, was there not singing following the triumph of Moses and Israel at the Red Sea when they safely crossed and Egypt was destroyed when the armies of Egypt tried to pursue them? Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. We read in Exodus 15 and verse 1. And later in that same chapter, we read of dancing. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. That's in chapter 15 and verse 20. I dare say that the key difference between the singing and dancing of chapter 15 to the singing and dancing of chapter 32 is given to us in verse 25 of chapter 32. It says there, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, Others, uh, other versions translate that verse, the people had broken loose, Still another version reads, they were out of control. It's not terribly difficult to get the picture then of immodest, sensual, unrestrained carnality under the guise of worshiping Jehovah. The contrast couldn't be greater to the joy that was accompanied with reverence following the victory back in chapter 15 at the Red Sea. Now, I'm very much aware that it's possible to strain at a gnat when it comes to our discussions and debates and what we call the worship wars, so to speak. I believe the key to worship is to be found in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding, Proverbs 9 and verse 10. And this is where theology becomes essential. How exalted a view do you have of God and of Christ? If you can sing the words of the song of Moses with any kind of heartfelt understanding and appreciation of what they reveal about God, then reverence will govern your worship. From that song we read, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? I wonder today, is that how you see God and Christ? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? If you see Christ high and lifted up, having gained a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you see him that way, there won't be a trace of immodest sensuality in your worship. Sensual worship, I dare say, more often than not, conveys the message that 
that it's all about me. Godly fear and reverence show that worship is all about God. And because Christ is glorious in holiness and fearful in praises, then he is also understandably jealous for the honor of his great name. And when worship conducted in his name becomes characterized by sensual carnality rather than humble reverence and deep and abiding joy, then that jealousy for the honor of his name becomes provoked. So these are the dangers then to be avoided. Neglected worship, which can lead to pestilence. Hindered worship, which leads to plagues and self-destruction. And perverted worship, which also leads to plagues. I can't close our study this morning without pointing out that in the case of Moses and Israel being called out of Egypt to hold a feast unto the Lord, sacrifice was essential. So in chapter 5, in verse 1, we read, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And then in verse 3, And they said, The God of the Hebrews had met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. In verse 1, it's holding a feast. In verse 3, it's sacrifice unto the Lord. The same would hold true for the Passover sacrifice, that would have taken place the night the Israelites were delivered from Egypt. It was the blood mark on the doorposts that exempted them from the plague of death of each firstborn. So there's obviously a close connection between the sacrifice and the feast. How much more in our day? when we look back on the true and real sacrifice that all the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to. Now, I'm very aware this morning that had we been able to gather after our usual order, we'd be meeting around the Lord's table this morning. We'd be engaged in a spiritual feast upon the remembrance of Christ's broken body and shed blood. Oh, how I hope and pray that we can do it next month with even greater appreciation and joy when at last we're able to come together again. In the meantime, let's make sure that in all our worship, whether it be corporate worship or family worship or personal worship, make sure that you make much of Christ's atoning death. His atoning death, you see, is foundational to our worship because his atoning death is foundational to our acceptance with God. If you'll do that, if you'll ever keep in mind the blood of the sacrifice, the blood of the everlasting covenant, keep that in mind, recognize that as foundational to your worship, and then avoid the dangers we've considered this morning then I dare say that the joy of the Lord will be your portion and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guide and guard your hearts. Let's close then in prayer. Let's all pray. O oh Lord, as we bow now in thy presence, we do confess that the Lord our God is glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, as doing great wonders. Especially do we stand in reverential awe, dear God, when we consider the atoning death of our Savior on Calvary's cross, where we see all the attributes of God coming together to accomplish our salvation, your holiness, your justice, and your love and your grace and your mercy all joining at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And on account of what he has done, our worship may be acceptable to thee.
Oh Lord, we do pray that thou wilt help us to avoid neglect in our worship, whether it be corporate worship, family worship, private worship. Oh, may we indeed worship thee in spirit and in truth. We thank thee for what Christ has borne, that there was a sense in which he bore the greatest plague of thy judgment that we might be redeemed. So, Lord, hear our prayers and take our thanks and help us to sanctify this day. Help us, O oh Lord, to consider the theology of pestilence and plagues. And we do ask, O oh Lord, that in thy wrath thou wilt remember mercy and that thou wilt turn the hearts of many in this nation to Jesus Christ. And when this plague is lifted, O oh Lord, may sin be restrained and may there indeed be a better national attitude toward the worship of Jesus Christ on his day in his house. So hear our prayers, O Lord, and take our thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.